Starbucks is a primary place for people to have conversation, to meet. It's a social place. Specialty coffee sales are increasing by 20% per year and account for nearly 8% of the $18 billion U.S. coffee market. According to statistics, over 50% of Americans drink coffee, which is equivalent to 150 million Americans drinking espresso, cappuccino, latte, or iced cold coffees. Coffee statistics also show that among coffee drinkers, the average consumption in the United States is three cups of coffee per day. Currently, there are approximately 24,000 coffee shops across America, and the average business sells approximately 200 to 300 cups of espresso and coffee-based drinks per day. If that is the average shop, how many cups does the largest coffee house sell in a day? Quite intriguing. Today, we are looking at the man behind Starbucks. Firstly, what is Starbucks? Only the best coffee house in America, if not even the world. It is an American multinational chain of coffee houses and roasters reserves. It is the largest coffee house chain in the world, and its headquarters are in Seattle, Washington. The company is best known for serving its customers hot and cold drinks, whole bean coffee, micro ground instant coffee known as Via, espresso, cafe lattes, full and loose leaf teas, fresh juices, frappuccino beverages, and snacks such as chips and crackers. Some Starbucks locations also offer beer, wine, and appetizers. The business has received significant and sustained criticism about its business practices, corporate affairs, and its role in society at large. Conversely, its franchise has commanded substantial brand loyalty, market share, and company value. Up next, I'm sure you must be thinking, how did this company start? How did it manage to be this big? Well, grab your pencils. It's time for some history lessons. It took three students studying at the University of San Francisco to to start up the company. Jerry Baldwin, Gordon Bowker, and Zev Sigal all had one thing in common, and it was their love for coffee and tea. They invested and borrowed some money to open the first store in Seattle, Washington on March 30, 1971. When brainstorming name ideas, Bowker suggested the names that started with st were powerful, so they came up with Starbo. After a while, they realized it sounded just like Starbucks, and they decided to name it after the first mate in Herman Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick. The partners saw Alfred Pete as a major inspiration for their business. His success encouraged them to base their business on selling high-quality coffee beans and equipment, and Pete's became their supplier. After buying a used roaster from Holland, Alfred Pete taught Bowker and Baldwin his unique style of roasting beans to create their blends and flavors. By the early 1980s, Starbucks had opened six stores in Seattle that were unique from their competitors with their top-quality fresh roasted coffees. They also purchased Pete's Coffee, and they began to sell espresso coffee. One of the partners, Siegel, decided to pursue other interests and left the other partners to continue running the business. Up next, here's where the story changed. Along came Howard Schultz, who was a sales representative for Hammerplast, a company that sold kitchen equipment and housewares from which Starbucks bought drip coffee makers. He decided to pay a visit to very much talked about Starbucks. He was so impressed by the company's success that he decided to apply for a job there. With luck, he became the head of marketing at Starbucks in 1982. As head of marketing, Marketing, he began to re-strategize the business to make it more customer friendly. He did so by making brochures for first-time customers who had trouble making the right selection. The brochure was to guide them into making the right coffee choice and its method brought in more customers and made their customers more trusting of the company and its product. In 1983, Schultz attended a housewares show in Milan and he was impressed with the country's cafe and he brought the idea back home to Bowker and Baldwin who didn't buy it because they did not want Starbucks to drift from its its traditional model of business. They wanted it to remain a coffee and equipment shop and not a cafe that sold other types of coffee. Next up, Starbucks let go of a man with a money-making idea and he put it to good use. Schultz opened his own coffee chain in 1985 that he called Tu Guarnale, and it was an immediate success that expanded in various cities. In March 1987, Baldwin and Bowker decided to sell Starbucks and there he was. Without wasting time, Schultz purchased Starbucks and he combined all of his businesses under the name, and he committed to his cafe concept for the businesses only with the additional sales of beans, equipment, and other items in Starbucks stores. The same year, he opened Starbucks. He expanded the business.
business out of Seattle and opened new locations in Vancouver, British Columbia, and Chicago. Schultz didn't stop there. He expanded the business across the Northwest and the Midwest, and the company was roasting more than 2 million pounds of coffee annually. As of 2020, the company operates over 30,000 locations worldwide in more than 70 countries and over 26.5 billion in revenue. Next up, after Schultz gained control of Starbucks, he automatically became the chief executive officer. He served as CEO from 1986 to 2000, and through him, the company pushed past its limits and expanded largely. He left Starbucks due to exhaustion from growing the office from a regional coffee chain to a global company over a period of 18 years. He returned eight years later because the company was shifting from its values and it was beginning to suffer loss. When he returned in 2008, the company's fortunes were flagging. Its stock price had fallen over 75% over the previous two years, and the competitors, like McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts, were topping the sales. Starbucks reached a spot where it depended on opening new stores for growth while the already established store was declining. Schultz knew he needed to make the necessary changes to save the company. He started with firing nearly all executives, shutting down lagging stores, and chartered a new course for the company. Between 2000 and 2020, Starbucks stock had climbed by approximately 2,100%. After he rescued the company from crashing, it ranked number five on Fortune's list of the world's most admired companies in 2018 and 19. In 2018, he announced that he was stepping down from his position, but he had been honored with the position of Chairman Emeritus of Starbucks. In an interview, he said, In 2018, I officially left Starbucks and became the Chairman Emeritus, but the three million people who have worked for Starbucks over the decades are never far from my mind. Together, we built a public company that achieved the fragile balance between profit and responsibility that my parents would be proud of. Up next, now we know the name of the man behind Starbucks' huge success. But do we really know the man behind Starbucks? Howard D. Schultz was born on July 19, 1953, and is an American businessman. Schultz grew up poor and lived in public housing in Brooklyn, New York. He served as the chairman and chief executive officer of the Starbucks company from 1986 to 2000 and from 2008 to 2018. Schultz attended Northern Michigan University, where he graduated with a BA in communications in 1975. He was the first in his family to graduate college. After graduating, Schultz stayed in Michigan and worked at a ski lodge for a year. He then took up a job in New York as a salesman for Xerox and was recruited by Swedish kitchenware manufacturer PAI Partners to be general manager of its U.S. subsidiary, Hammerplast. It was from here he went on to make a living through Starbucks. According to Schultz, he never set out to build a global business. In his words, I set out to build a company that my father never had a chance to work for, one that treats all people with dignity. His father had a work-related accident that caused him to be immobile, which led to his death. Not long after his father died, Starbucks became one of the first companies in America to give health care insurance to all its employees. Today, Schultz has been named the 209th richest person in the world, with a net worth of $4.3 billion. Next up, Schultz isn't only known for being the man behind Starbucks. He has ventured into a couple of other things. He also owns the Seattle Supersonics basketball team from 2001 to 2006. He led a group of 10 investors, and together, they bought the team from the Ackerley Group for $200 million. He wasn't exactly the best owner of the Supersonics. Many described him as naive, and he was called out for running the franchise as a business and not the sports team that it was. In 2006, he appealed to the Washington state legislator that he needed $200 million to renovate the key arena to build a new arena for the team. Unfortunately, he was not able to convince the government, and he went ahead to sell the team to Clay Bennett, chairman of the Professional Basketball Club, LLC. The team was later moved out of Seattle. In 2019, Schultz openly admitted and apologized for his wrongdoing. In his words, I think the lesson I have learned with regard to the Sonic situation is when you have power and responsibility, you need to show restraint. He also said, Selling the Sonics as I did is one of the biggest regrets of my professional life. I should have been willing to lose money until a local buyer emerged. I am forever sorry. Schultz publicly considered a candidacy in the 2012, 16, and 20 U.S. presidential elections as an independent candidate. He declined to join all three contests. In 2019, he began to prepare to run for the 2020 election, but he decided to step down because if there were too many candidates, Trump may have had a chance in winning the elections. This is the story of the man behind Starbucks. That's a wrap for today's video. Thank you for watching. Make sure you stick around for more exciting content on this channel.